to the Fit for Privacy podcast with Punit Bhatia. This is the podcast for those who care about their privacy. Here, your host, Punit Bhatia, has conversations with industry leaders about their perspectives, ideas, and opinions relating to privacy, data protection, and related matters. Be aware that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not legal advice. Let us get started. Today, we are going to talk to someone who has a background in email and direct marketing. In fact, he is the chairman of Email Sender and Provider Coalition. He has served over 20 years in privacy field, helping various startups and Fortune 500 companies. At present, he is the chief privacy officer of a company called Wirewheel, which provides privacy software. I'm talking about none other than Rick Buck and let's go and listen to what he has to share with us. So welcome, Rick. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to this discussion with you. That's great. You have this uh, huge experience or tremendous experience in privacy. So tell me, how did you get into privacy so early? Because you've been in privacy almost 20 plus years. Yeah, it's been a very long time. Um, and it's been a really interesting journey and evolution. Um, I um, um, am in great company with many people in the industry uh, who um, came up in the privacy world through the database marketing, direct marketing world. Um, so we were all uh, what was known in those days as list brokers. Uh, they're known today as data brokers. Um, we were all very heavily involved with organizations like the Direct Marketing Association, um, many of us were um, involved with helping the Direct Marketing Association uh, build out and develop a program. I believe it was called the Privacy Promise mm -hmm. uh, on the better and ethical use of data. Um, uh, one of the great uh, productions that came out of that all these years later uh, is the great Sheila Kochlicher. And Sheila, if you're listening, hello. Um, who um, is one of the great data ethics leaders uh, in the industry and one of the great minds in our industry. Um, but we all started uh, back in the database marketing days. And I was working for, at the time, um, an email marketing company uh, that uh, in the day handled uh, most of the legitimate email that, uh, that many people listening would have received. Uh, we represented airlines, we represented book music companies we rented uh, represented all the stores you shopped at in the mall um and um um you know the long and the short of it um is that um one day the then president of the company uh came into my office and tapped me on the shoulder and said uh uh this thing called privacy is getting more and more important we need somebody to run the privacy uh organization here um at our company and uh, you seem like the right guy to do it and, uh, and my response was, thank you, I'm flattered. I don't know anything about privacy. Um, and he said, you're perfect for the job. And um, so now uh, 20 years later, uh, 20 plus years later, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be one of the people that, um, that knows what I'm talking about. Um, it's really been an interesting evolution to see how privacy has, um, has evolved um, and has matured. Um, uh, through a very specific lens, um, I would argue that the seminal event uh, that kicked off that discussion between uh, uh, me and the president of my company, but really kicked off the importance of privacy, uh, was uh, the DoubleClick Abacus story. And if you remember, um, the DoubleClick bought a company called Abacus. Abacus at the time, without getting too nerdy and detailed, uh, was a company that had all of the database marketing attributes. It was a co-op. It had all the database marketing attributes that every major cataloger in the world had. Um, and they were the old school um, analog marketing, if you will. DoubleClick was the new and emerging uh, digital platform. Um, and um, the way in which they bought the company and uh, merged the data um, raised all kinds of eyebrows about inappropriate use of data. Um, and um, in, in, in my eyes and in many people who came up from the same side of the streets as I did, that was the moment that kicked off uh, um, the whole privacy movement, certainly here um, in the United States and, and in Europe. Certainly there are much more 
important and consequential events that have happened that have to do with governmental issues and business issues. And, uh, but that was certainly, uh, I would say, one of the cornerstones of building out the movement. In those days, many of the people who were privacy advocates and the privacy representatives um, at their companies were the marketing teams. They were not the legal teams. They were not uh, the InfoSec people. They were people who were trying to market their products and services, who were having difficulty doing so because privacy, this new thing, privacy, um, had become a friction point. And over the last 20 years, as we well know, privacy has really matured. Um, uh, you know, there are far more attorneys um, in, in, in the practice now, um, and that's probably a good thing. Um, there are many of us who have matured as practitioners uh, who are in senior leadership roles around the industry, which is good. It's a nice juxtaposition of attorneys versus uh, 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 practitioners. So people who really understand what the law says and what the obligations are. And then on the other side of that, people who run the day-to-day -day business affairs at their companies um, who have to understand how to work through the law. Um, and it's really been quite fascinating to see, uh, to see how all that's changed um, since I first got into the industry you know, 20 plus years ago. Um, at the same time that I got into the industry, um, a, an organization that I have uh, been lucky to be involved with right from the very beginning, uh, was the IAPP. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in the early days, the IAPP was just a handful of people. Uh, the work that Trevor and others at that company um, have done over the last 20 years is nothing short of impressive. Um, they are running conferences, or at least we're running conferences in the pre-COVID days, uh, multiple times a year all over the planet, gathering thousands and thousands of people and the most prominent of people to speak and present um, at those conferences. Their certification programs have become ubiquitous. Um, they are, are in many different tracks uh, that, influ that, 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 that involve privacy. Um, and they've even gone so far as to have privacy recognized by the ABA as a legitimate discipline in law practices. Um, so, um, you know, we, we've seen the industry uh, grow. We've seen the industry mature. Um, and uh, it has been nothing short of a fascinating career for me for the last 20 years. That's very interesting and very fascinating. And I fully agree with you on both the aspects. Privacy is a business issue, a marketing issue. The lawyers, the privacy professionals are there to help interpret the law, understand the law, propose options. But end of the day, the business and marketing teams are the ones who have to make those choices and live with those choices. And also that IPP is now the gold standard when it comes to privacy certifications or even being in a professional organization. But through these years, you mentioned about the double click uh, uh, acquisition and are there any one or two pivotal moments you have seen which led to the relevance of privacy increasing so much. Of course, there has been the internet and you mentioned the marketing and the databases and the data brokers, but what are the one or two other than the double click uh, that are key pivotal moments in evolution of privacy? Yeah, I would say a couple of things. One, um, the, um, I would say most lay people and maybe even many people um, in the business world um, never really have had a clear understanding of the difference between privacy and security. Um, and um, by way of all of the significant data breaches that have happened over the last 10 or 15 plus years, um, you know, oftentimes uh, privacy and security um, have gotten lumped into the same category. Um, and so um, uh, by way of the high profile breaches that have happened, um, while it's become increasingly more important uh, to companies uh, to enhance their security profiles, um, as a result of that, um, I think that um, it's also influenced the way in which they have increased their privacy profiles. Now, in that, in that same way that breach led to those kinds of things, uh, breaches um, um, probably were um, part and parcel some of the reasons why we saw uh, the uh, Europe move from uh, 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 an act to a regulation and the maturity leading to what is now GDPR um, and the e-privacy regulation, um, uh, e-privacy directive, um, uh, talking about the way in which yeah. we should um, uh, we should collect and manage and use and inform people about the use of data. 
and how those laws have influenced other global laws and how those laws have influenced other now here in the United States, the state laws. And then compound that with things, you know, looking at it from an American lens, um, you know, the Snowden story and the Shrem story yeah. and uh, where government surveillance comes in and this continuum of, you know, uh, um, 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 being able to have a free internet uh, and the free use of data um, with the, you know, uh, the, the other end of that of, you know, protection and government surveillance and where do our civil liberties end on one end and where, you know, is government intervention um, on the other end and marketing um, implications. Um, and um, so I, 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 you know, I think if you look at those as big macro events, yeah. um, those, those to me seem to be some of the real big um, influencing factors uh, that have led the privacy world to, um, to be focused on more specific things and to uh, grow more robustly uh, and, you know, um, in, a, in a number of different categories. Yeah, I would uh, agree with that. And in fact, I was reading about a story that 9-11 also played a part in the way privacy is being uh, managed or not managed, whatever way we want to look at it. The critics say not managed in U.S. And uh, we know that there are other laws which manage it. That due to 9-11, the government wanted extra surveillance and then they needed to kind of let go of the privacy aspirations, but focus on the security aspiration. Now, it's always an interesting debate, and you already mentioned security or privacy, but that also had an influence on how privacy is mm. perceived, at least in the United States. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that's a great point. I had not thought about it through that uh, perspective, but I think that's exactly correct. So now that was the evolution of privacy and the key moments, but when we look at it from perspectives, like when I talk to uh, youngsters or when I'm delivering a lecture in the university or anywhere, sometimes or most times there's one person who would say privacy is dead. Mm -hmm. Or they'll say, I don't need privacy. Of course, I manage them or I answer them saying, hey, give me your bank account number or send me your bank account number. This is the email. By the way, nobody has done it so far. But do you see in your uh, journey that even different generations view privacy differently. I mean, I don't want to say that you or me are old, but I'm just saying perspective in terms of generations. Do generations see privacy differently in your view? Yeah, I think there's, uh, I think there's a big generation gap uh, uh, perception on privacy. Um, um, and I agree, I, I don't know that you and I would be described as old, but maybe we are mature. Um, we'll use that term. <laughs> Um, and people who uh, who are uh, you know looking at privacy through a mature lens are looking at it. You know, I, I think people who are of a certain age, and I'll, and I'll say we're in that that group, um, have a perspective about privacy um, that is steeped and influenced uh, and understood uh, by values and technologies and business models that existed pre-internet. Um, and there were very definitive lanes about how data could be collected and where data could be stored and how it was stored and how much possible data it was even conceivable to collect. It was a fraction of what we can collect today. Um, and there are now, if you fast forward, um, you know, generations of people who have been born already um, who have known nothing other than the technology world in which we live in today. Um, you know, sounding like an old an old guy, we didn't have computers when we were kids. We didn't have cell phones when we were kids. We didn't have connected devices when we were kids. And that's not good or bad. We just didn't have them. There's a whole generation of people that have been born where they don't know anything other than that. Um, and so um, I, I think that um, it's really uh, beholden on um, people of our generation to educate the people going forward. Uh, the importance of privacy, what it actually means, what are the consequences of it? You know, information is power, knowledge is power, um, and with uh, you know, with power comes responsibility. Our responsibility is to educate and set the foundation for the way in which the industry is going to develop. You know, if we look at the uh, the internet revolution, uh, to put a name on it, um, if we if we put a metaphor around that in terms of a human life cycle. You know, we're at an adolescent age right now in that uh, we're just coming to terms with 
uh, with our strength and our coordination and our and uh, and uh, and our bravado uh, about what it is to be a young uh, you know a young active adolescent. Um, and so we're making a lot of mistakes and we're learning a lot of things. Um, and um, you know where technology is going to be even ten years from now, let alone fifty years from now, let alone hundred years from now, is going to be vastly different and almost unfathomable from where we are today. Yet, if we boil it down to the pure principles of what it means to use data, to collect data, to protect data, um, and to allow people whose data it is to make the appropriate choices uh, and understand the value proposition of that data is highly important. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, to the extent that we are able to bridge that gap with, with, uh, with the younger generation, um, I, I think that's really important. And then just in terms of, a, you know, an overall historical perspective, pendulums swing left and right. Our pendulum has swung, I don't know if it's left or right at this point, but it's all the way to one side at this point. And eventually it's going to come back and correct itself um, because people will realize, even the younger generation will realize the importance uh, of data uh, and the consequences of the misuse of data um, and, um, 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 and um, that privacy is, is an important human value. I think, uh everybody needs privacy, it's only the threshold that probably the younger generations are more open to share or more open to let data be collected. But when even when you ask them, can I do this or can I follow you? Then they also say, no, 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 that, right. that's my personal information or that's my private domain. Correct. So they maybe don't use the notion that we use for privacy, but that's still privacy that they're asking for because none of our teenagers uh, want to be followed up none of them want to be surveilled or asked, have you done this? Have you done that? And that's another dimension of privacy because we tend to, because of this uh, internet and all, tend to focus on personal data as being privacy, but there's much more to privacy than personal data only. Absolutely. Yep. Very good points. So from perspective of a privacy professional, and especially in a responsible position that you are in as a chief privacy officer, what responsibilities do you see that you have towards business or you would recommend to a fellow pri chief privacy officer or data protection officer when it comes to helping business or helping others or especially anyone who is caring for privacy? So what is the responsibility of a privacy professional from that standpoint? Because people will have perceptions, people will have different ideas, but what message can we give them? Yeah, you know, again, I said it earlier, but um, information is power. Uh, you know, data is the is the is the the uh, the fuel that 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 it is the currency for information, if that's the right way to say that. Um, businesses all use data in some way, shape, or form to run their business, um, yeah. and um, and it behooves them um, to uh, have a brand uh, that instills loyalty and trust from their customers. Um, and one way to do that um, is to uh, is to have the highest profile to be the gold standard um, that when you are collecting data from your customers and your customers could be your employees, your customers could be paying customers, um, your customers could be, you know, a number of different constituencies. Uh, but there is a value proposition around the why I'm asking for your data, what I'm doing with your data, what you get in return for that, what your ability is to say yes or no, I want to participate, I don't want to participate, um, um, is all really, really important. And I think it behooves certainly startup companies, um, even though they think they're too small and it may not be important, to build out the foundations of a privacy by design mentality, if you will, uh, as they're thinking about growing their businesses. And if you're a more mature business, um, one, you know, um, a legislation is gonna force your hand on it, but number two, um, um, it's important um, to really take stock um, in, uh, in what it is you do with data, um, to have a firm understanding of what specifically the data is you are collecting, is it necessary? Is it useful? Um, do you have a classification uh, table set up for that data? Do you understand the different classes of data that you have? Do you have different rules around the use of that data? Do you have different rules around retention and destruction of that data? 
Um, do you, are you able to, uh, to listen to what your consumers are saying? Uh, can you honor them rights, whether or not a law says they have rights uh, or you are just treating them with respect um, um, uh, as the business that they're doing business with? I think all that stuff is critically important. Um, number one, it reduces your risk. Number two, it increases your profile uh, and increases the brand uh, and, and brand loyalty uh, for, the, for your company and for your business. You have almost summarized the entire privacy law into, <laughs> uh, into, a, into, into an answer. Start with giving them the choice, then be lawful, know what data you process, classify it right, increase customer trust. What a good summary it is. So in that context, as a privacy officer, chief privacy officer, what challenges do you face on a day-to-day -day basis and how do you solve them? You know, I think right now, one of the challenges that most privacy officers are concerned with is the increasing, you know, increasing number of, of laws uh, that are being presented uh, and, and, um, and how that influences and affects the way they're running their businesses. The good news is that more and more countries, more and more states here in the United States are, uh, are rolling out new privacy legislation. The good news in that privacy legislation is that much of it is steeped in sort of a GDPR mentality, um, but there are nuances across all of those laws um, and, um, and the ability to understand uh, how and where um, um, I as a privacy officer need to comply with that. Um, you know, do I need to do privacy assessments? Do I need to do privacy assessments in Virginia? Do I need to do them in Colorado? Do I need to do them in, in, in California? If I'm doing the one in California, is that good enough for the one in Virginia? Um, is that good enough for GDPR? Um, and, you know, un, un, until we get some, uh, some history uh, behind the new and emerging laws, um, that's going to continue to be a challenge. Um, here in the United States, we don't yet have a unified federal privacy law. Uh, be curious to see if much in the way where can spam uh, preempted the, I believe it was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, 28 plus state laws, state spam laws. Um, I, I think um, that um, it, is, it is possible. And in fact, in my own opinion, and this is a, a widely argued uh, opinion, um, we will see pri federal privacy uh, uh, legislation at some point. I don't think it happens in the next 24 months. Um, but um, but but I think um, I, I, I think there are all kinds of vectors that are that are pushing us in that direction. Um, the other thing that I would say that's a challenge for privacy people um, is making sure that your company has consistent messaging from the top down uh, about privacy and the importance of privacy, so that from the bottom up, when you are doing your privacy assessments from the bottom up so that your privacy team, um, when looking to increase or change budget, or that your marketing team um, needs to get uh, use cases approved for the use of data, or your product team needs to get use cases approved for, for new products or new way that products work, um, that, um, that people know going into that as they're building those things, what their responsibility and obligations to privacy are um, and so that they're already starting to build their programs um, and their budgets and their strategies around a privacy forward program, rather than having to be, you know, the privacy department, the chief privacy officer who says, mm, I'd love to let you do that, but I can't because you need to fix this, 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 and this. Um, and, um, you know, if all that stuff was already checked off uh, and the product manager comes to me and says, I've got a product, it's using data, here's the data it uses, here's the use cases that it has, here's the permissions that we're gonna give people, um, here's the way we're gonna protect it and collect it and destroy it, um, here's how we collect it, yada, yada, yada. Um, then I, as a privacy officer, only have to make finesse strokes to the program rather than have to go back and force them to go to the drawing board. So, um, uh, you know, and then again, there's all the other uh, things that, that a privacy officer worries about on a day-to-day -day basis, but I, I would say those are two big ones. I would love to have that ideal product manager who brings in all the information that we're talking about. <laughs> exactly. Because normally, if you remember when GDPR was coming in, yeah. there was a nightmare letter which was floating around. 
probably created uh, by somebody uh, notoriously that every company was looking at saying, can we answer this one? So I have seen not the ideal one, but the nightmare ones uh, more, more often who Absolutely. don't tell you what my product does, who say we don't collect personal data and then you ask them and then you discover, oh, that's personal data, that's personal yeah. data. So it's the story is other way. So I do understand and associate with that challenge. And in a world that's changing so fast and it, technology changes even before we know it, and we always say that laws lag technology, technology leads and laws lag. How do we empower, because you mentioned a, a short while ago that uh, companies need to empower individuals, give them choices, make them understand what is being collected, why it's being collected. How can that empowerment be enabled? Because the change is so fast, so rapid. You know, um in some cases, it's, it's as simple as, you know, let's assume in a digital environment, any place that you are going to be asking people for personal information, um, that directly where you ask them without causing a friction point, um, put a link to your privacy policy, put a brief description of what it is that you're going to be doing with the data, put a brief description of what their rights are, right? Um, it's really easy to um, uh, to talk intelligently to your customers. And if you talk intelligently to your customers, you know, they'll respond in kind, in, in kind to you. I think that's probably one very good way to start that process. It's just exactly. be transparent. Yeah. Care for their privacy and demonstrate you care. And rather than have them having to search where, where what's happening, where's the privacy policy, where's the privacy statement, Correct. give them the notice there and then itself and let them check it if they wish to. Yeah, you know, this concept of just in time notice, uh, putting it in plain English, plain native tongue of whatever uh, the, the first language is of the people that you're speaking to, put it in understandable terms um, uh, and make it easy to get there. Absolutely. And also, I think make it layered because you don't want to bombard them with five or 10 pages immediately. Yeah. Give them a little bit. And if they're satisfied, let them go back and then more, then more because I was uh, on a website a uh, couple of times uh, in last few weeks and I, I'm fascinated. They have a cookie statement and I, I usually tend to play around and say, I don't accept all cookies. And then they're giving me so much of granularity that in the mm -hmm. end I say, reject all, or I don't even choose because there's a yeah. scroll of at least three pages that I have to do to choose cookies. And it's like, come on. Make it simple, say necessary cookies and maybe functional cookies, mar marketing cookies, analytical cookies, but not ask me to choose at that level, seven or eight layers of yes. in one screen. It's completely crazy. Now, uh, talking about Wirewheel, how do you protect privacy and what does Wirewheel do? Yeah, you know, Wirewheel um, is uh, in an emerging space. Um, we are a privacy automation uh, and a privacy program management software platform. Uh, we're one of many companies in that space right now. Uh, the, it's great to see that the investment community is is uh, putting a lot of money and a lot of attention in that world. Um, you know, there are lots of good companies in our space. Um, and so, uh, a, I love the competition, but b, I love the fact that um, that it's being you know that 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 the need is being recognized uh, and services are being provided. Um, and so, you know, companies like Wirewheel um, uh, do two, well, we at Wirewheel in particular serve sort of two major functions. One of which um, is on the data subject access request side, uh, building um, uh, custom portals for brands to use uh, to handle the data subject requests uh, from authenticating the request all the way down to fulfilling the request in a secure platform being able to give the reporting that you need for regulators, being able to give you the reporting that you need to put on your website at the end of the year, um, um, uh, automating with uh, backend systems at your company um, so that um, you know, the fulfillment process on those subject requests uh, can be done um, um, on an automated basis so that you know, trying to eliminate as much uh, uh, human capital that, uh, to do those things. Um, and it makes that process a very efficient, a very uh, uh, auditable um, um, and, uh, a process. On the other side um, is the privacy program management, helping companies with asset inventories and 
business process assessments and um, uh, you know records of processing agreements and uh, privacy impact assessments and vendor assessments and transfer impact assessments and you know all the things that companies need to do to document the way in which that they're running their privacy program. Um, our platform uh, provides the tools um, and the technology for for uh, companies to do that much more efficiently than you know the spreadsheet mentality that they're working off of right now. That's very nice because I think when you move from privacy projects that's initially putting in an Excel and getting the documentation into privacy operations and you manage it on a day-to-day -day basis, you cannot manage with Excel. You need automated solutions. Correct. You need to have a more structure and more rigor into it so that anyone can update and anyone can look at it because when the regulator walks in, you just cannot say, oh, the Excel is not updated. Yeah. <laughs> that's not yeah. a good answer. Exactly. <laughs> so. Let me get into some quick uh, questions. That's a new segment that we have. What is one skill that differentiates a privacy officer from being effective or being not effective? What's one skill differentiates a good privacy professional? Um, that's a great question. <clears throat> I, <clears throat> I would say one of the challenges that I've had as a privacy officer is that um, you know? I'll walk into somebody's office. Remember the days when we used to be able to walk into somebody's office. I will walk into somebody's office, and they see me coming, and I can see the look of terror on their face. Oh. Right? Oh no, Rick's here. I must be in trouble. Right? Oh. Um, uh, or oh no, we have to go talk to Rick. He's just going to say no. Um, and I'm saying that metaphorically, but um, um, you know, the privacy department, the legal department, oftentimes, and I think I said this before. Um, gets gets you know kind of this unfair moniker of they're the department of no, um, and um, and and I like to say we're not the department of no, we're the department of no but right. I understand that you want to get from point A to point B, um, but there are things in between point A and point B that the way you're doing this right now um, are, is going to potentially get the business into trouble, um, and we're not going to be able to do that. So. Let's think about this. Let's turn this on the access just a little bit so that you can get actually beyond point B um, and, and do it in a better way. And so uh, to boil that down to answer your question, you really need to have good listening skills. You need to have good communication skills. Um, I think it's important that you understand technology, that you understand law, that you understand marketing best practices, um, and then um, trying to be uh, uh, a good negotiator between all those spokes of your wheel um, uh, as, as you're trying to build out new programs or, 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 or help with use case approvals or, um, you know, any of the things that a privacy officer has, has oversight on. I would fully agree because most people look at it, privacy as a hard skill. I mean, anyone or most people can understand the law, read it, interpret it. That's still the easy part, the difficult, because even if you don't remember it, you can go and cross check. Right. But in terms of the communication or negotiation or managing the expectation, there's no manual that can help you because that's always dynamic. That's always fluid. And that's where the real challenge for us as privacy professionals is. And you don't have any single answer. Yeah. The other thing that I would say is a privacy professional, a good tool to have in your belt and most of us do is a good network. Um, yeah. And when I say a good network, I mean a good network of other privacy officers and other privacy professionals. Um, I can't tell you how many times throughout my career uh, uh, a, a, a colleague will pick up the phone or slack me or text me. Um, they may be a competitor, they may be in a completely different industry, uh, but an issue will come up, a problem will come up that's an industry-wide problem um, and we'll just sit down and say, hey, how are you thinking about approaching this? Yeah. Um, you know, what are the challenges you're facing with this new law? How are you, how are we as an industry going to be able to do better at this? How am I as a company? How are you as a company? You know, you're my client. I'm your vendor. How are we coming to terms with these things? Um, um, and, uh, uh, and leveraging that network is, I think, is a mission crit critical skill that, you um, um, the privacy officers, much like almost any other C-suite person, um, needs to be able to develop. Yeah. So uh, uh, the next one I'm going to ask is, again, a trick question. So if your CFO tells 
that he has about hundred thousand dollars and he can put into one project either the privacy project or the security project which one would you choose and why um well i would give it to the privacy product because the security guys have been getting that money for the last 10 years so um you know let's share a little love with the privacy team um no all kidding aside i i i mean i would certainly defend the privacy argument in that um the security people, and I'm not oversimplifying it, their job is to protect the data. The privacy team, the privacy role is to define the rules about how the data can be used. You know, what are the governance issues? What are the, what are the, uh, 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 what are the regulatory issues? Um, what are the use case issues? What are the marketing issues? Um, and then work very closely in conjunction with the security people uh, to develop the policies, to develop the controls, to develop the audits. Um, and, um, um, but I think, um, you know, the, 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 the privacy team in some respects is the Lego board for that, from which that, that grows. Um, uh, and, and I'm not discounting in any way, shape or form the importance of the security side of it, but, um, um, I think privacy programs are probably often understaffed and under budgeted, uh, more so than, um, um, um than some of the other departments in the organization particularly data yeah. security yeah. i would agree with that that privacy departments are usually understaffed and under budgeted let me continue the trend of these uh, trick questions one more just one more so you have to hire a team member in your privacy team there's one person who's a good communicator you mentioned communication is important but he does not know anything about privacy and he says i will learn it and on the other hand you have somebody who's certified, who's good in privacy, but you get a perception, get a feeling that he's not good in communications, who would you choose? I, uh, I have to choose the communicator. Uh, going on the premise, you know, that, that you've left out a lot of data points about my interview process with both of these people, but going on the premise that not only is he a good communicator, but that I understand that he or she um, uh, will be a, a, a quick learner and is a smart person, uh, and will be a solid team member. Um, collaboration, interpartmental cooperation is key uh, to being effective in what you're doing. Um, and if I can teach that person uh, the privacy stuff, uh, knowing that they'll be a good advocate for that um, versus trying to change somebody's personality uh, trait uh, to be a better communicator and a better team player, um, uh, uh, my guess is I, I'll have more success uh, with the former than the latter. I had expected that when you said you will choose a communicator because you can teach somebody privacy, but you cannot teach communication so quickly. Of course, communication also over a period of five years, three years, you can build it up, but privacy, you can build it up much faster. So Rick, it was a pleasure to have you. Time just flew by. Would you have one final message for our audience. Um, you know, again, information is power. Um, with power comes responsibility. Um, use your data in a responsible way. Build responsible uh, privacy programs. Transparency, I think, is first and foremost about the way in which you build your privacy programs. Um, if you are running a clean privacy program, um, the likelihood for you to have trouble with uh, with 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 legal comp, uh, compliance, uh, you're likely to have uh, trouble with uh, uh, bad public relations um, is certainly reduced uh, uh, by a significant uh, factor. Um, you know, I, I don't think privacy is dead. I think privacy is on a journey right now. Um, it's in an interesting place. There's a lot of attention being thrown at it uh, right now through two vectors, the ad tech space and the government use of data or inappropriate use of data in both cases. Um, but, um, you know, be responsible um, and, um, uh, you know, we'll point, the, the ships are pointed in the right direction. We'll, 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 um, we'll, 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 it's important for us to just keep influencing the industry um, so that we pass the right laws now that we put the right industry best practices and standards in place um, and that we continue um, this privacy journey together um, as responsible corporate citizens. Of course, we've just got started. So if somebody wants to contact you, what's the best possible way? 
Uh, I'm uh, rick.buck at wirewheel.io. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, and um, happy to field questions from, uh, uh, from anyone listening about uh, how to run better run their privacy program. And uh, I must uh, share that Rick has a program called Privacy Roundup, which is a weekly, is it a weekly thing? It is a weekly, yep. Yeah, it's a weekly news roundup on privacy, which is very useful. Maybe you want to share something about it. How can people access that privacy roundup? Yeah, if you uh, just uh, if you, if you uh, search for Wirewheel on uh, on LinkedIn, um, uh, there will be links to all the previous ones. Uh, our our privacy roundup is a weekly short blog that we do uh, on on Wirewheel. Excuse me, on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. um, and we pick and choose uh, something that was interesting that happened in the news as it relates to privacy the week before. Uh, and shed some light on that issue um, and uh, implications uh, for people in various industries uh, where privacy um, uh, is involved. Wonderful. So, yeah, I, I hope you'll find us. Yeah, yeah. you can send, send me the link and we will put it in the show notes so yeah, that people can get it easily. So thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful to have you. And I wish you all the success in your privacy journey and let's stay connected. Thank you, Panit. This was my great pleasure to, to, uh, to join you today. Thank you so much for reaching out to us and uh, uh, look forward to, uh, uh, to this and many more of your, uh, of your podcasts. Thank you. Thank you. Fit for Privacy helps you to create a culture of privacy and manage risks by creating, defining, and implementing a privacy strategy that includes delivering scenario-based training for your staff. We also help those who are looking to get certified in CIPPE CIPM, and CIPT through on-demand courses that help you prepare and practice for certification exam. Want to know more? Visit www.fitforprivacy.com. That's www.fit, the number four, privacy.com. Thanks for listening. If you liked the show, feel free to share it with a friend and write a review. If you have already done so, thank you so much. And if you did not like the show, don't bother and forget about it. Take care and stay safe. Until next time, goodbye. If you have questions or suggestions, feel free to drop an email at hello at fitforprivacy.com. That's hello at F-I-T, the number four, privacy.com.